Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this Corbel webinar. This is the third in our series and the first webinar of 2018. Today's webinar is ARIA, Powering Your Access Management from the Cloud, and today's speaker is Fiona Sanderson. My name is Natalie from Instruct Eric, and I'm your host for the webinar today, and I'll be manning the chat and questions functions. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Corbel website for later viewing. The interface has changed slightly from our previous webinars, if you attended any of those. If you have questions from, for Fiona, please write them in the questions window in the GoToWebinar application, and we'll pass the questions to Fiona at the end. And if you can't make the questions window work, then post your question in the chat window as before, and I'll be checking both, so don't worry. Just to start with a brief introduction of Corbel. Corbel is a Horizon 2020 funded project combining 13 ESFRI research infrastructures from the biomedical field. Corbel aims to work together to transform the understanding of biological mechanisms and to help translate this understanding into medical care. Modern biomedical research can be very complex and involve a wide range of different technologies and expertise. Corbel aims to help such scientific projects, which are often at the interface between different biomedical disciplines, to make it easier to access resources from different research infrastructures. Corbel aims to harmonize access and services, for example, biological and medical technologies, biological samples, and data services for complex research projects involving more than one research infrastructure. Our speaker today is Fiona Sanderson. Fiona is an ARIA developer at Instruct Eric. Fiona joined Instruct Eric as a software developer in the summer of 2017. She came to us from the University of Oxford, where she spent the past four years, first at the Department of Engineering, then with the Department of Pharmacology. Fiona has a particular interest in user-driven interface design and agile dynamic software development. She's been involved in the development of ARIA version two, as well as Instruct Eric representation in Horizon 2020 projects. I'll hand over to Fiona now. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so I'm Fiona. I'm a software developer uh, at Instruct Eric. Um, we're going to start today uh, with an overview of Instruct, uh, who we are, how we work, what we do. Uh, then we'll have a quick introduction to the ARIA system, uh, looking at uh, each core area uh, that the software offers. Um, we'll be focusing a little bit more today on facility management um, because this webinar is mainly aimed at facility managers uh, and users, although everybody's welcome. Um, if you want to, um, you can let us know in the chat area what kind of experience you have with ARI, if you have any, um, or any questions that occur to you uh, as we go through. Uh, and Natalie will be keeping an eye on those, and we'll probably pick them up at the end. Um, we do run training events uh, with more hands-on sessions. I've had a couple of people ask me if that's what this is. Uh, it's not. We're just going to be doing uh, overviews of the services that we that we offer, um, but we do run those. Um, those are advertised on the uh, Instruct website, and I'll give you a link at the end and perhaps a few more details. Okay, um, so Instruct is a pan-European research infrastructure uh, in structural biology. So the goal for Instruct is to try to integrate the structural biology community. Uh, and make high-end technologies and methods available to their users. So the model that Instruct has is one of having uh, member countries. And the member countries provide access to designated Instruct centers uh, around Europe and outside of Europe um, and the infrastructure within them. So a really wide range of high-end technical equipment. Um, the member countries also provide access to the support staff in those centers. Uh, to try and make sure that users get the most of their access to the equipment during their visit, make sure it's used in the most uh, efficient and optimal way. Um, and the national funders also cover some consumable costs for that access. And in return, Instruct supports the access process itself. Um, so that goes from proposal submission uh, to peer review, to visit scheduling, and then finally at the end, generation of uh, reports and statistics. Uh, we also provide funds to cover some of the costs of the visit, so that might include travel costs, accommodation costs, 
up to a maximum of 1500 euros per visit. Um, it might be more in some cases. And access is open to anybody who's within an Instruct member country um, and who is successful during the peer review process. So um, this is a map showing the current member countries of Instruct. Um, we've currently got 11 uh, national governments who have signed up. Uh, blue here represents the current member countries. Greens are countries that are in negotiation to join Instruct. So there's a couple of countries who are in discussions currently, including Spain, uh, Germany, Finland. Um, so we're fully expecting that to grow. Um, Instruct has a five-year funding commitment with each of those individual uh, country governments. Uh, so uh, pretty securely funded. And there's also um, the Instruct Ultra project, which is a uh, European Horizon 2020 project uh, due to kick off very soon uh, in February, I think. Um, and that has been developed to extend the reach and remit of Instruct. Uh, so to expand the Instruct membership from what you see currently to widen the user base. So uh, to engage with new European communities, but also international communities. Um, and to improve efficiency, so to make Instruct more scalable, more reliable. So that's a, a quick overview of who Instruct are. Um, if we move on to ARIA, uh, ARIA is actually an acronym. Um, it stands for Access to Research Infrastructure Administration. And it's a piece of software. It's a collection of cloud services um, that's been developed out of Instruct. Um, first introduced in 2011 to support uh, Instruct's proposal management system. Um, and then ARIA version 1, um, as we might think of it, was introduced in 2013. Uh, and then there was uh, another major refresh in summer 2017, um, which was uh, following the release of version 2. So it's expanded considerably over that time period. Um, we offer a lot more services in a number of uh, different areas. We're going to go through the four core areas of ARIA, um, which are on the screen at the moment. So uh, we'll start off with access management, then facility management. We'll uh, have a quick discussion about community services that we offer, uh, and then we'll end with uh, our data management offerings. Um, and just to make the point uh, now that uh, these four areas are all joined up with um, our very up-to-date authentication system. Um, so because ARIA is in use in many different facilities uh, and by multiple access providers, um, we've put together a single sign-on offering, uh, which is pretty critical. So users can choose from a number of authentication choices. Uh, at the moment, uh, you can log in using uh, an Instruct-specific account uh, or an Educane account, which is a, a global collection of huge number of universities and research institutes. Uh, or an umbrella ID. Um, umbrella is the identity system for photon and neutron facilities in Europe. Uh, and then when you log in, you can connect external identities, multiple external identities to one single Instruct account. Um, so the beauty of ARIA, I think, is just in how uh, customizable it is, how easy it is to set up. Um, that's probably going to be a theme today. Um, the idea is that we offer these services as white labeled so solutions so that users can set them up uh, basically on their own. So they can have their own booking calendar, their own network website, whatever instance it's going to be. Um, they don't have to worry about the um, internal services of that, the internal details. They can just focus on their core competencies. And we provide full support in setting uh, those services up at the moment, um, but they are very adaptable. Um, you should be able to do it by yourself, but we, we are there to, to offer as much support as you need. Um, development for ARIA, very much ongoing and in a number of different areas. Um, so we try to make a point of working with our user communities um, so we can be responsive to their needs. Uh, we actually have a working group exactly for this so that uh, certain users who have signed up for it can test out new functionality before it's released. Um, we've got a number of longer term development plans, some of which are mentioned here. Uh, so we're going to extend our data management services. Uh, we'll be introducing a new help guide system uh, at some point this year um, to allow uh, user generated content uh, so specific to a 
particular area uh, and allow tagging as well. Uh, and we'll be expanding our email notification system, hopefully sometime in the first quarter. So ARIA's grown out of Instruct. It was developed by Instruct developers, but it has a much wider application. Um, and this is a list of just some of the organizations who currently use ARIA. Um, the ones, the organizations that are listed here are, are mainly organizations that have implemented ARIA pretty thoroughly. Um, so for instance, Westlife is a Horizon 2020 project uh, that runs its community base entirely through ARIA. Uh, the Asprey Biostructural Laboratory, which is in uh, Leeds in the UK, they run all of their facility management through ARIA. Uh, Diamond use our API endpoints to pull data in through, uh, so they have their own internal um, management system, um, but then they use ARIA for the um, sort of application end. Um, so just to make the point really that it's, it's a very well established bit of software, it's used by some very substantial organisations. It's not really going anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we start off with um, access management, um, so we offer a full proposal submission and administration system. So uh, user submissions pre-award and post-award can be very simply managed um, and full granular control over every step of the process um, can be made. So submission through to moderation, through to the scientific peer review process, approval, post-approval, through to reporting. So we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail. So um, when we say a proposal um, submission, what we really mean is uh, an application for access uh, at a technical facility. So um, administration of uh, those applications by users can be carried out in the system to arrange access to a centre or a technical facility, just to make that clear. Um, so this screenshot here shows uh, part of the catalogue available to users. Um, so users can get a, a list of technology types that's offered um, by a particular uh, funding route, and then they can see which centres specifically offer that technology. Uh, so what you can see here is the centres that offer Cryo EM, uh, just a small selection. Um, and that might just be the centre details, and in some cases you even can pick which machines you would like to use at that centre. Um, and in some cases they, uh, there is multi-access platforms available. So the Cryo EM at Neeson offering there, you can see that uh, there's multiple funding routes available. So you might want to be funded by INEX, you could be funded by Instruct, uh, or you could go for a sort of collaboration approach. Um, I don't want to go into access too much, but I'm just trying to make the point uh, here that um, after proposal submission, the workflow that follows is very malleable. Um, so if you want to pre-screen submissions uh, for technical feasibility, um, so to see if a user has made a sensible selection, if what they want to carry out can be done on the machine that they've chosen or at the centre that they've chosen, um, and you want to, to check that right at the beginning, uh, that's possible. Um, or you can um, do that after the application proposal is peer reviewed. So the peer review process um, will be making sure that it's scientifically sound um, and significant. And then you might want to have um, this technical feasibility check. So um, we can change the workflow around. We have done before. We can make it custom. Um, we can match your needs. Um, and that process of peer review, I should mention, is, is also customizable. So it can be done by panel. You can have panel review. Um, or you can have um, individual reviews as well. And I think it's worth pointing out that there are forms for every step in this access workflow, and they are all customizable. So there's the submission form, which is shown here. This is the um, uh, proposal form for iNext. So an iNext user would select a technology and then a center. So here, hopefully, you can see it's um, they've chosen structural biology and instruct center at CERN. Um, and then they get this form to fill in uh, where they detail what it is that they want to do. Um, and that's just one example of one form. Um, but 
they are entirely custom. So there's a, a huge variety of field types available. You might want a, a drop down field or to be able to attach a, a file, different types of files, uh, input different types of publications and um, look at those details. Um, we also offer um, custom field types as well. So if it's something very particular, we can do that. Um, and then the forms are automatically generated depending on the funding route. So for here it's iNext, and then this form is just kind of generated with the fields that are appropriate to that funding route. Um, and there's even intelligent detection of overlap. So if, there's, if you've accidentally put in um, multiple uh, fields that are identical, then those are sort of uh, filtered out. And at each step in this process, as these, as these forms are submitted and filled in, uh, there are notifications that are sent out to the user uh, so that the user is informed of all of these actions being taken. So they get email notifications uh, and it's also shown on their user dashboard so they can keep track of uh, what's happening with their proposal. So this is an example of the management panel. This is uh, the administrator view of the proposal dashboard. I'm not going to go to, into any detail here. It's kind of just to make the point that we have a design principle of housing actions in one page view. So we're trying to make it as simple as possible. So you should just have one page for one action. Um, we also use consistent color coordination to try and make navigating the system a little bit easier. Um, so you might notice that uh, green is there for uh, proposals that have been approved or visits that have been approved, uh, red for rejected, blue for proposals that are in the moderator assigned route. And that's kind of used throughout the system. Uh, just to try and make it a little bit more navigable. Uh, we also offer an inbuilt messaging system. There's a screenshot of that here. Um, that allows users to be supported individually. Um, the messages can also be generated at different points in the system. So there'll be um, buttons available saying things like, do you want to talk to the administrator? And that will generate the message in the messaging system um, which includes uh, all of the appropriate users, so maybe the administrators for that funding route, maybe the administrators uh, for that facility, depending on which point you clicked at. And it also allows anonymous contact as well. Um, and it also lets people uh, filter messages um, by proposals or by funding routes um, so that the appropriate administrators can see conversations that relate to their proposals. Um, so separate from the uh, messaging system, we also do email notifications. Um, so those goes, go out to alert users that there are unread messages in the messaging system. And that can either be a digest list or it, it can be the individual um, content of the messages uh, that's choosable in the profile. Um, there's also uh, an automated email notification service for whenever actions are taken. Um, so, for example, uh, if the facilities need to complete a technical evaluation for a proposal, an email is automatically generated and it's sent out with a one-click link that sends them to the review page, just for simplicity. And if they don't, uh, then there's reminder emails that are sent out every week um, just to stop proposals stalling. Um, and e all emails are branded as well um, with custom themes. So, uh, what you can see here is uh, an email that's branded with the instruct theming and the layout is, is done to that styling. <coughs> so I'll mention a couple of the tools that we offer in this area. Uh, this is uh, one such tool. This is a proposal timeline. So this displays um, in a fairly simple overview the status of multiple proposals in a really visual way so that you can see the flow of access through the system. Um, you can pick up on any delays that might be occurring at a particular point in a sort of repeatable way. So you can, you can see patterns that emerge this way. Uh, it's not terribly clear from the screenshot, but the colored dots portray action. So you'll get one dot generated for submission, uh, one at approval. Uh, you might, I think the red dots might be uh, the visit being started. Um, in the actual system, this is from the test system. In the actual system, there's also hoverable text associated with each one, so you get details and it's filterable and all that kind of thing. Um, so uh, that's a very simple overview, as a lot of our tools have, but uh, actually the tools underneath that are very powerful. 
I'll show you another example. Excuse me, just a second. <coughs> um, so another tool uh, that we offer uh, is that of filterable reports generated from the proposal data. So you can get custom reporting metrics uh, for all of your access. Um, and there's the option to use inbuilt templates. Uh, so uh, we offer uh, those reports in a Horizon 2020 formatted way, for instance, just for ease. Um, uh, we also uh, host open calls for projects. Uh, we hosted the Corbel first open call last year. Uh, we'll be hosting the second uh, open call for Corbel in February. I think it's due to kick off. Um, so the forms uh, for the calls uh, are custom as they are for proposal submission. They can be generated by customers. So in this case, generated by Corbel themselves. They don't have to hang around and wait for um, ARIA developers to do it for them. They can just do it. Um, and then the calls again have a, a very simple management interface uh, where actions can take place. So um, submissions for the call might be approved or rejected. There might be discussion via the messaging system. And then the calls, uh, the call display on the website takes on the branding of the customer again. So here you can see the Corbel branding uh, in action. So um, that's the access management system. We'll move on to facility management. Um, this is I mean, they're integrated, but it is it is separate. So while an application to access a facility might be reviewed and awarded via the access management system, um, the details of that visit or, or sample submission, depending on the visit, might be organized uh, via the facility system. And there's quite a few different areas of functionality within this that we'll have a look at. So um, there's two views of the booking calendar available. Um, one is viewable within the administration panel, one within the user dashboard. Um, there's an example of the, the booking calendar being shown here. Uh, and those displays are configurable to units of time. So you can have monthly views, weekly views, daily views. Uh, and they also have color, co uh, color coding for machines. Um, so what you see here is the booking calendar for one week in January for two separate machines. And the machines each have a color associated with them. Uh, and what you see in that calendar and what you can do in that calendar uh, is decided by the perm permissions uh, that you have. So you'll only see machines that you have permissions to access. Uh, and you might be able to drag and drop some of those entries around. You might be able to delete them. You might be able to enter the booking forms. Uh, it all comes down to what permissions you have. Um, each machine or technology within a facility can be configured to accept either remote or physical visit access, uh, or both if you prefer. Um, but each type of access can have individual configurable workflows. So if you want a machine to only accept remote access, uh, you might want to set up checkpoints, create checkpoints, customize those. Uh, and by checkpoints, I basically mean steps. Um, I'll show you. I'll show you the interface for that in a minute. Uh, or if you would rather have physical visits, so if you want users to actually come and work a machine, uh, then you can schedule and manage those within the system, uh, and use the messaging system to help with that as well. Um, so you can add bookings to the calendar, uh, but you can also add machine outages. So if there's repairs being done, or if a machine's being upgraded, then you can enter this in a, a slightly different way in the system. Uh, with, with different options. Uh, so you might want to set outages to be repeated at specific intervals or a specific frequency until any particular given end date uh, or to be repeated a set number of times. So if, for instance, you have a machine um, that needs to be uh, upgraded uh, or have you know, repairs done or whatever uh, for two hours, on the last Friday of every month, you can set that up and it will just it will just automate and repeat until you tell it to stop. Um, and those outages can also be given a specific color just to make it more obvious to the user. So uh, that's usually red, kind of makes sense. Uh, there's different machine configurations available as well. Um, there's an example of the configuration form just there. 
uh, and that allows uh, quite a few different uh, options to be inputted. So you might want to specify a default access length. So you might want to say that a visit will last two hours default. Uh, you might want to control how much access a user can book in a given period. Uh, so you could specify that a user might can't book more than eight hours on a particular machine in a week, say. You can uh, specify if you want bookings to be overlappable or not. So can more than one user uh, be at a machine at any uh, given time? Uh, and you can control whether a user needs to specify a date or time at all. Uh, you might want them just to submit a very general request saying, I would like to use this machine or this bit of technology. And then the machine administrator uh, can allocate a booking for them. Uh, there's also custom booking fields. So you can just see that at the bottom where it says booking request form configuration. Uh, so that would allow the machine administrators uh, to add their own fields. Um, again, you know, we have we have a set selection. Uh, but we can also have custom fields. So whatever requirements a particular particular machine or method might require, you can match those. <coughs> so there's two more configuration options here. There are there are a lot of a lot of possibilities. Uh, the top uh, screenshot is the interface to add checkpoints. So this is for remote users. Um, so you can add a step and you can allocate a color with a step again to kind of make na uh, navigation a bit more obvious. Um, and these then become part of the visit process. So the visit then has to proceed through whatever steps are added at this point, um, added by the machine administrators. Uh, so for example, uh, if a user wanted to submit a sample to a beamline machine at the Diamond Light Source facility in Harwell in the UK, uh, the sample would need to be sent in. So there's a checkpoint um, that you can just about see there where the facility is uh, awaiting sample. Um, once it arrives, uh, you can move into the processing sample step, which is fairly obvious. Uh, and then the delivering results step where the data is sent back to the user. Uh, and then there's, what is that? there's the post visit review, which would be uh, feedback uh, and then completion. So the point of this is that the administrators can use this system to track every step of the visit and they can communicate this to the user because it shows up on the user dashboard so they can see what's happening to their sample. They can see what, what, what phase it's in. <clears throat> At the bottom there, uh, there's the interface to manage user training, which is also something that we uh, offer as an option. There's two users there. This is from our test system. So I'm there with intermediate experience and I've put in nine requests for, for booking. Um, and then there's Jane Doe, who has advanced experience. She's put in six requests. Um, so this is just to demonstrate that you can add users um, and you can give them different user uh, levels. So there's five that we offer. There's default. There's associate, novice, intermediate, and advanced. But the meaning of all of those is decided by the machine administrators. So they can decide what a particular training level entails. So again, there's various options for that. So you might want to uh, restrict some users so they can only book within working hours, so within nine to five. And outside of that, uh, they can't place anything. Uh, you might want to give some users access to amend other people's requests. Uh, or you might just, or, or you know, just to be able to amend their own. Uh, and you might want to restrict other users or maybe default users to only be able to view the calendar and not submit requests at all or make any changes. Um, so the training levels can be incorporated into the system, into this very granular uh, method of security permissions. Uh, and then just to come back to branding again, this is three examples of the booking calendar for different facilities, three uh, here. So we've got INEX on the left. Uh, I think that's Instruct in the middle. And then uh, the Asprey Structural Molecular Biology Lab uh, in the UK on the right. So uh, three different facilities using the same ARIA calendar service, but with different styling, just to make that point. Uh, so I'll leave facility management there and we'll move on to uh, community, our community offerings. 
so the idea here is that different networks can be hosted within ARIA. So you can configure your own hub of activity with your own uh, specified look. And you can add news and events, and jobs, and forums to engage with your users in a very targeted way. So within different community areas, like I say, um, you can add news and events. If you've got uh, specifically targeted uh, things that are coming up that are relevant to your particular community, so it might be that you belong to a particular Horizon 2020 EU project or a particular lab, um, you, can, you can create a, a community for those and then add those news and events. Um, and then those news and events can be incorporated into the global ARIA feeds. So you get additional exposure as well. It's just a little benefit if you want to. Um, so your news and events then end up on the Instruct front page. So they get they get more widely seen. Uh, and it allows community administrators to set their own permissions. Um, it can be as specific as you want. So you can set permissions for individual items. So one specific uh, particular event maybe, uh, or you might want to give a subset of some users control over all of your pages. Uh, you can kind of just choose. Uh, we also provide a fully integrated CMS system, a content management system. So that lets users uh, create their own pages, their own custom pages. Uh, again, adhering to the network styling. So you don't have to muck around with HTML or CSS. You, you can muck around with HTML if you want to, um, but you don't have to understand it. You can just you can just click edit page and just enter it straight on, and then it's it's immediately viewable. Um, we also offer a CRM service, a customer relationship management service. Uh, so if you want to send out mail shots to your network, to your um, mailing lists, uh, you can do that. And again, those emails would have network styling. So the idea is that you can have a community that's managed within the ARIA system, but it looks uh, to your users and to outside uh, people like it's an entirely separate website. This is an example of the management dashboard uh, in the admin panel. Uh, again, uh, we're trying to um, create very simple one page views. So this is your dashboard. You can see news and events and jobs and pages. Uh, you can also uh, have forums. I haven't really mentioned this. Uh, you can host forum areas for your community hub. Uh, again, controllable. Uh, so if you wanted to have a public area in the forum for general discussion that anybody can raise topics in or comment on, that's possible. Um, and if you want to have an, um, an area that's restricted to a subset of your users for private discussions, that's also possible. Uh, and this is uh, an example of this in action. So this is the community website for Instruct Ultra, which is the EU project that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and again, you can see that um, uh, there's a particular distinct visual identity uh, that's associated with that. But then the news and events that are listed there, that's controlled using the admin panel. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so last but not least, we're going to um, just whiz through data management here. Um, we'll talk about API integration in a second. Um, sample management is listed here. That's actually an area of future development, something that we are hoping to implement this year. Uh, so this involves enabling the system to integrate with robots at various facilities to allow automated data management. So uh, the idea is that we can take metadata for a sample uh, from one robot and then we can move it around to another perhaps as a visit progresses so in a sort of automated fashion. Um, but like I said, that's not something that's actually available yet, but that's something that hopefully will be coming. As so what we do currently offer for data management uh, is a very thoroughly documented API endpoint, uh, allowing programmatic data access. Uh, so this is implemented by a number of synchrotrons and facilities across Europe. Uh, there's uh, details for this on the ARIA website. So the URL is at the bottom there. It's aria.structuralbiology.eu. That's got all the documentation in. Uh, so you can use these details to pull data from ARIA into your own submission system uh, and allow users to import existing pro uh, proposals 
uh, from ARIA into your local management system if you want to, if that's the system that you have. Um, so on that ARIA website, aria.structuralbiology.eu, uh, there's a demo of this available, which I would recommend using before you uh, try and implement it. Uh, there's a screenshot of that here. That's what you're seeing at the moment. So uh, in the demo, uh, users are given a list of their proposals. Uh, so on the left, this user has one proposal. The title is API test with crystallization and MX bean time. And then they can click import proposal from ARIA and it maps the details associated with that proposal onto the facility's internal management system. That's the way that this works. Um, and this sort of method allows consistent branding as well, because as you can see, this, this national synchrotron facility has its own logos and styling and color um, themes and all that kind of thing. Um, I'll leave it there with data management because I don't know uh, how much that's of interest to the people attending today. And we will move into the question part of the, of the webinar. Yes, thank, thank you, Fiona. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please do, please do post your questions in the questions section or the chat. Um, so I'll start with one of my own, actually. Um, so how do the external access visits from people wanting to use your facility and your internal bookings interact? Um, so this is possible if it's configured. If it's not configured, it's not possible. Um, but you can configure an individual machine to allow external bookings. Um, so at the appropriate step in the visit in the uh, access management system, um, when you get to the, the step where scheduling takes place in that system, uh, you can enter a scheduling date and then that takes you directly to the booking calendar. And as the information that you've uh, added, uh, into the booking field. Uh, it doesn't uh, directly import it into the booking calendar because there's frequently um, additional custom fields associated with the machine. So there might need to be, I don't know, sample details or a grant code or something. Um, but you, know, you just fill those in and then you add it and then it adds it directly into the booking calendar. Um, so that's kind of the, that's the bridge, I guess, between the external access of visit, of visit planning and then the internal um, visit planning, which is booking calendars, essentially. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know that's <laughs> very interesting. Um, we've got a couple of questions on chat. Please do keep sending these in. Uh, so our first question is, how do you manage the communication with your users? And what are the challenges of keeping a fluid communication with your user base? I'll just look at that. Um, so I, there's a few ways of, of communicate, uh, communicating with your users. I've mentioned a few of them. Um, so we've got the uh, internal messaging system, um, which, like I, uh, I said, can be generated at certain points in the process. You can just click a button and that creates a message and TCs inappropriate people and sort of adds a, uh, a heading that's appropriate and tags it and that kind of thing. Or you can just go to the messaging system and you can just find whoever it is you want to talk to and do it that way. So you can do it internally. Um, or there's also these automated emails that go out at certain points um, uh, in the uh, access uh, proposal workflow. So for instance, uh, when uh, a proposal is about to be peer reviewed, those emails will go out to the, the peer review people, but there'll also be an email to the user to say, your proposal is at this point, this is happening. Uh, it's also visible on the dashboard. Um, if you've got a community hub, um, or even if you don't actually, I mean, there's a CRM uh, service as well. So the custom um, customer relationship management system uh, that lets you send out mail shots uh, to mailing lists. So if you want to uh, do broader communication with, um, you know, a range of users uh, in a targeted way with branding, you can do that through that. Um, challenges, um, yeah, there's definitely challenges, just making sure that people understand what's actually happening, um, making sure that they're, they're, they're happy to communicate with us. And we do have so many methods of communication um, that hopefully that would be, that would be clear to users. Um, if there's any sort of specific instance that you want to discuss, you know, feel free to, to add that in. Thank you. Um, so our next question, 
Uh, great presentation. Slide number 16. Ooh, which one's that? <laughs> <laughs> Good counting there. Uh, how can I access this UI as a common user with an account in Instruct? Or is it only available for users with special permission? Um, so it is and it isn't. I've just had a look at um, uh, slide number 16. That's the slide which had the administrator view of the proposal dashboard. So if you're a common user, if you just sign up and you haven't done anything, you haven't submitted anything, uh, you can still go into the admin panel. Once you've logged in, you'll find that there's a, an admin button that appears at the bottom um, of the structural biology website. And you can go into that um, and you'll see different different tabs in the menu. Um, but what's listed there will depend on your access. So you'll only see the proposal dashboard with all of the proposals listed if you are an administrator for a funding route, um, because we don't want people to be able to see the details of proposals, obviously, uh, if they're not supposed to have permission. Um, but for instance, you'll, you'll, you'll find a tab there uh, for facilities that will have booking calendar, no matter what permissions you have. But what you see on the booking calendar um, is controlled by what access you have for what machines. Um, so it kind of depends who you are. Um, but that's, that's always there and that's always viewable. So you, you can always go in and explore if you want to. Yep, thank you. Um, our next question. <coughs> are there any opportunities for training for facility managers? Uh, there is. I was going to mention this in a minute, but I might as well do it now. Um, we do run um, training sessions, uh, mostly through Instruct, because ARIA has kind of come out of, uh, come out of Instruct. Um, so they're always listed on the uh, Instruct website, which is uh, structuralbiology.eu. It's on the screen at the moment. Um, and there's a, the next slide after this has an actual link. Um, so we're running a workshop in February, uh, which is for hands-on training in the ARIA system. Um, it's really for administrators, so that's facility, facility, managers, facility yeah. managers, essentially. Um, and we will probably be doing a webinar on the same topic, on, on hands-on um, uh, use of the system. So, so really going through each screen, how you get to this, how you move the, 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 the visit along, how you input this, like very, very detailed. Um, we haven't actually arranged that yet. I'm, I'm thinking probably late February, maybe early March, and I, we might be doing that through the Corbel webinar series again, um, but it's not actually arranged yet. Uh, when it is, it will be on the uh, Structural Biology website, uh, and I'm sure we'll be sending out um, emails with details of that as well um, to the sort of um, the mailing list, the Corbel mailing list, Instruct mailing list. Uh, it should come up. We'll keep you informed. Yeah, and if there is anything specific, you can always just email us. Um, in some cases, we're quite happy to go out to certain facilities and just sit down with people and show them, but it kind of depends on how much time we have. Thanks, Fiona. Um, next question, slide 26. <laughs> very slide 26. Okay. Different styles for different facility. Where is it hosted, and can this host be bound to facility domain name? Um, y yes, uh, so, um, so it's, it's hosted within, sorry, I should let me get an example up. It's, it's hosted within the website for that particular facility. So, um, if I go to INEX, for instance, which is INEX.eu, uh, in fact, yes, yeah, I can share my screen on here, that's a better idea. Hopefully it won't be too slow. A problem with live demos. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, how this works is that um, the, the individual facility websites will have um, links to, oh, I should probably search for that, shouldn't I? Sorry. Uh, we'll have links to the um, uh, booking calendars or the um, submission site. Uh, so user dashboard will take you to the booking calendar. Uh, you do have to have um, you need to log in because obviously we need to know what permissions you have in order to view the calendar. Um, but then what that takes you to is the structural biology website, um, but branded with INEX branding. So it's actually hosted on the structural biology ARIA website, but it doesn't look like it. And then when that's kind of complete, it kind of 
spits you back out at the at the um, at the kind of host website. So you you end up back at the INEX website. Does that make sense? Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> makes sense to me. I think. Um, so slide thirty two, okay. which um, okay. we'll we'll work out what slide thirty two is. So. Yep. Um, is the demo supposed to work with pre-filled secret ID and client ID? I've recently tried without success. Um, so with the, with the demo system, you should find details of the uh, test user account, which I think is, I think it's aria at structuralbiology.eu for the user account. And then I think it's test ID or test account for the password. So you need to log in with those in order for the secret ID and the client ID to work. Um, but it should do. I was using it this morning and it seems to be OK. Um, yeah, if you if you I think in fact, I'll have to show you. And hopefully it won't. Uh... So in the uh, I think it's in the API. She says. In the OAuth demo, yeah, there we are. So you need to use the um, make sure you're logged in with these credentials for the for the test system to work. That might be why it's going wrong. Um, if you are struggling with it, do do email me. Very happy to 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 give you hints or try and figure out what's going on. Thank you. Um, so I have a question as well. Um, who performs the reviews when you say reviews or? Uh, this this is a slightly confusing um, area. We we try to um, delimit between scientific review, the scientific peer review process, uh, and the technical evaluation process. So the scientific peer review um, is done by individual scientists uh, who are nominated uh, and selected by a moderator. Um, and that sort of determines whether or not access should be awarded. And then technical evaluation uh, is a review, but that's done by the facility that the user wants to access and um, by ever, whoever that is that they've specified to do that. Um, so we, we try and use different terminology uh, for these processes to, to avoid confusion. But yeah, technical evaluation is a review by a facility, essentially. And a scientific review is the peer review, which is done by uh, nominated scientists for whatever funding route you're going through. Um, there's, uh, we do have help guides. I should mention those actually. Um, they might, they might help with some of these issues. Um, so on the structuralbiology.eu website, if you type in help, or you type in help guides, uh, you'll find a help page, which has a link to our help guides, which are currently in beta, um, cause we've only just put them up. Um, but they cover quite a large area uh, of our services, not everything. We haven't totally covered everything, um, we hope to. But there is there is a substantial amount there. Uh, and we welcome the feedback if you want to have a look and see if it answers any of these questions. Thank you. And how much does it all cost to use ARIA if, if I wanted to set up? Uh, that That's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> uh, so ARIA is... Uh, a tool of Instruct has been written by Instruct developers and Instruct as, as, as a research infrastructure uses it in a day to day manner to, to, to do their access management. Um, so it's, it's kind of funded by Instruct, really. Um, so if you want to, to use it as a, as a as a community or to use the, the CRM facility specifically or uh, for the booking calendar, it's actually basically free. Um, we don't actually have a, a charging model for that. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, if you were if you were interested uh, in getting set up on there, the best thing to do would just be to uh, email us. Uh, I've got our email address listed on the next page, but it's um, admin at structuralbiology.eu. That's a good idea. Yeah, so it's just there. Um, and if you you just let us know what it is that you want to do or what you want to set up, um, you, yeah, you can pretty much just do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we don't seem to have any further questions, um, I'd like to thank our speaker, Fiona Sanderson, and uh, you, our audience, for attending this webinar. 
and we would also like to advertise our next webinar in the series which will be taking place on Tuesday the 6th of February at 3.30 again in the afternoon Central European time. The webinar is titled Lightweight Service Management for Research Infrastructures, a Fit SM Approach. The speaker will be Sai Holsinger from EGI and we look forward to seeing you all then. Uh, please see the Corbel website for information of upcoming webinars and registration links and also to view past webinars in this series, including this one when we put it online. Thank you very much. Thank you. And goodbye.